So I was watching a news show, and the, uh, the anchor was reporting about uh, uh, insurance uh, salespeople who were selling policies to young soldiers going to Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, getting in, you know, insurance policies, probably a good idea. And, uh, you know, disability policies. The problem was these were bad policies. And all the money was going into the pockets of the salespeople. And uh, when the government heard about it, they stepped in and had them return all the money to the young soldiers. And the news anchor said, I hope there's a really hot place in hell for salespeople who would do this kind of thing to our young soldiers. You know, dishonesty in business, lying, cheating in schools, falsifying reports are all really big problems today. The U.S. Treasury estimates it loses billions of dollars every year from false reporting on income tax returns. Amy Coet Nelson, in her article, You Can't Handle the Truth, writes that 93% of respondents report one or more kind of dishonesty toward people at work or school. 96% report lying or committing other dishonest acts towards those close to them, in their family. 90% of people looking for a date online lie on their profile. You know, maybe you're not a believer. So a person who claimed to be a Christian lied to you, maybe in business, and you vowed that you would never have anything to do with Christians again. This is a sixth in a series of messages called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. And today, Jesus takes on this whole matter of lying and telling the truth. In Matthew 5, 33 to 37, he gives his exposition on the Ninth Commandment you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. As Jesus does with all the commandments, he simplifies it and turns it into a grand positive. He turns the focus from lying to telling the truth. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had become fascinated with the technical details of the law so they could find loopholes to get out of obeying them. For example, in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath? Teachers asked, can you eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath? Since the hen worked on the Sabbath, they said, no, you can't eat that egg. Uh, if an animal gave birth to a foal on the Sabbath and it fell into the ditch, could you pick it up? The Essenes said, no, that would be work. The Pharisees were too humane for that. They said, yeah, you could, you could pick it up. But they had all these uh, debates about one week one could do on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus got into big trouble with the religious leaders because he refused to get technical about matters of the law. Uh, so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes on all these technical interpretations of the law. Now, to understand Jesus' teaching, you need to know uh, that our Lord loves to use extreme hyperbole. He overstates his points. So in Matthew 19, he says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into <coughs> the kingdom of God. This is a blow to the disciples because they thought rich people were blessed by God and if rich people can't get into heaven, then who can? Uh, the first command Jesus takes on in the Sermon on the Mount is murder. This one is clear cut. Gives you a lot of comfort. You say, you know, I've done a lot of bad things, but I've never murdered. I'm not a murderer. So you feel pretty good about yourself. Until Jesus gets done with you <coughs> and says, if you get angry with someone, call somebody a fool, you've committed murder. He gives the law its full meaning. Next, he takes on adultery. He says that people that are married made a commitment and should stick with that commitment. They should have eyes only for their mate. They need to put all their energies into pursuing their mate. Then he uses extreme hyperbole. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Doesn't want us to literally gouge out our eyes. He just makes the point that marriage is so important and sexual intimacy within marriage is so good that we must live as if we have no eyes to look at another person with impurity. 
Now Jesus takes on the ninth commandment in truth-telling. In Numbers 30, verse 2, God says, When a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. In Deuteronomy 23, God says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. And then Jesus says in Matthew 5, 33 to 37, read this uh, with me. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Uh, Jesus taught that Christ followers should say what they mean and mean what they say. When, Jesus, when people in Jesus' day tried to convince you that they were telling the truth, they would give an oath. Uh, the Pharisees, you know, tried to restrict these uh, oaths so that they, they could have a loophole. Uh, they said, if you swear in God's name, that's binding. But if you swear by heaven or by earth or Jerusalem or the temple or gold on the altar, it was not binding. See, they're very clever. Um, so Jesus talks to them in Matthew 23. Read this with me. Woe to you, blind guides. You say... If anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, Jesus takes on this whole matter of lying and truth-telling and says, uh, no matter how hard you try, you cannot avoid swearing by God because God owns everything. So don't make oaths at all. He said, they don't prove anything. They don't prove you're telling the truth. When someone says, I swear by the holy angel Gabriel, that doesn't prove they're telling the truth. It's just a, a pathetic admission to their dishonesty. They know people won't believe them otherwise, so they add this oath. When someone says, lightning strike me if I'm telling a lie, and then lightning doesn't strike, that doesn't mean they're telling the truth. It just means maybe God doesn't want to use his, his lightning on you. When someone says, I swear on a stack of Bibles, honest to God, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, that doesn't prove they're telling the truth. It only proves that God has nothing to do with silly oaths. So why use them? Jesus says, just tell the truth. If you're honest, you won't need to swear by anything. People will believe you. So what's the cure for lying? Jesus says, simply say yes or no. He says, don't swear on a sack of Bibles. Just tell the truth. So how can we learn to tell the truth? Let me suggest four ways. First, know that lying cuts us off from God. The Bible says that God is truth. That means dishonesty is contrary to who God is. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. When we make a promise, God says, you keep it because he takes vows seriously. And our, our whole culture has started down a slippery slope of not telling the truth. 
Uh, did you know that for the first 200 years of our nation's uh, history, let's say from 1675 to 1900, most of our public and private schools, uh, K through university level, were uh, based on the Bible. Our young people were once try, taught to read the Bible as their primary text for learning how to read. Uh, the early settlers of New England, for example, helped their sons and daughters memorize the alphabet, and, and uh, uh, 23 out of the 26 letters of the alphabet were based on a Bible verse or a Bible concept. Uh, and, and then they had a, a, a poem. This was in the uh, New England Primer, first textbook ever published on American soil. And uh, they would learn these letters of the alphabet uh, through these poems. Let me, let me read you one. Uh, Good children must fear God all day, love Christ all way, parents obey, in secret pray, no false things say, mind little play, by no sin stray, make no delay in doing good. Now, they had a, uh, another segment, Alphabets of Lessons for Youth, in other words, for teenagers, and uh, they were taught to uh, grow in their reading uh, by a list of aphorisms to engage their memory, and these were all based on the Bible. I'll just read you a few of them. A, for, you know, the letter A, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. C, come unto Christ, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Uh, e, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, K, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Well, you get the point. I'm not going to read through the whole alphabet. But uh, um, when viewed through our secular paradigm of education, it's staggering to think that our forefathers learned to read on the Bible. Gasp! And uh, that uh, the Bible was their textbook. Double gasp! Uh, the primer was used clear into the 20th century. That means our, our, many of the leaders uh, of this country before us grew up on the scriptures. Now, that has been progressively taken away from our schools today. So. The point I'm trying to make is that we've moved a long way from when we were taught to tell the truth as part of our core curriculum. 100 to 200 years ago, all students were taught a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. We were taught that telling the truth is more important than getting ahead financially. We need to get back to this because lying cuts us off from God. Second, remember that lying alienates us from people. Apostle Paul wrote, Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. We're supposed to be so truthful that people can take what we say to the bank. Lies do great damage to relationships. Uh, they cause mistrust. Lies destroy families. A young boy was uh, being mischievous and he cut down a tree in their family's yard. And when the father got home from work, he said to his son, did you cut down that tree? And he says, no. Well, dad was pretty sure he did. So he told him the story about George Washington, you know that. Cut down a cherry tree and because he told the truth to his father, he didn't get punished. So the father asked him again, did you cut down that tree? He says, I cannot tell a lie, father, I did. Well, father thanked him for being honest, and he didn't punish him. Well, a couple days later, the boy was being mischievous again, and he came out in the backyard and saw uh, an outhouse they had there, and, and he, it was on the top of a hill. He pushed it over, it went down the hill, and ended up on its roof. An hour or so later, his dad grabbed him by the arm and said, did you push over that outhouse? He says, father, I cannot tell a lie, I did. His father gave him a spanking like never before. He said, Father, what happened to the George Washington thing? Tell the truth, you don't get punished. He says, well, when George Washington cut down that tree, I'm pretty sure his father wasn't in it. <laughs> uh, 
There are also societal consequences for dishonesty. Forty years ago, when people called a repairman to do a job, they were pretty sure it would be fairly estimated and honestly carried out. Today, people assume they're going to get ripped off unless they're very careful. When politicians are extremely partisan, voters question their motivations and become cynical about politics. When people feel like they can't trust anybody, we get a world where it's like everybody for himself. Dishonesty cuts us off from each other. Why does lying cut us off from people? It's because lying violates our basic design. Some people say that when we break God's commandments, He punishes us. In reality, God doesn't punish anyone. We punish ourselves when we break God's commands. And God doesn't have to lift a finger. God enforces this commandment the way he does all the commandments, through the law of the harvest. Paul tells us, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you're a liar and you do that regularly, you will suffer the consequences of your falsehoods. You will eventually lose all your friends. Once people catch on that you don't tell the truth, they'll drop you as a friend. How can you be friends with, uh, with someone who lies to you? I mean, you can look people in the eye and swear on a stack of Bibles, but they still won't believe you. Um, you say, well, I don't worry about being lied to by somebody. I can look at somebody and size them up, and I can tell whether they're telling me the truth. But there are people today who are so accustomed to lying, they can look you in the eye and lie through their teeth. You know, you confront them about having an affair, they'll look you in the eye and say, me? Having an affair? Who do you think I am? What kind of person do you think I am? And by the time they're done, you're feeling bad that you confronted them. And then a couple weeks later, you learn that they were having an affair and they've been having it for months. They're so seasoned at lying that they can look you in the eye and you can't tell. But once you catch that they don't tell you the truth, uh, you won't trust them again. You see, we don't really break the law. The law breaks us. The law describes the basic design for all humanity. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus describes the way we function best. We function best when we get rid of anger and bitterness. And uh, we, we function best when we live monogamously and, and save sexual intimacy between one man and one woman in a marriage. We function best when we tell the truth. If you don't live this way, you'll suffer the consequences of breaking your basic design. You'll be miserable. So parents, it's so important that you teach your children not to lie. The kid says, well, nobody ever taught me. I didn't know it was wrong. That won't save them anyway. It can't protect them. They still will suffer the consequences of lying because they're breaking God's grand design. So Jesus' point is that Christ followers should say what they mean and mean what they say. Still a third way that can help us tell the truth is make yourself ask forgiveness each time you lie. If you've told a lie, don't look for some way to rationalize it. It wasn't that bad. Or to work it through so you, you, know, you don't have to admit that you lied. Every time the Holy Spirit convicts you that you lied, then go back to the person you lied to and say, you know what, I'm sorry. What I told you is not true. Would you forgive me? If you've done this, you know there's hardly anything harder than admitting you've done something wrong, that you lied in asking forgiveness. And then you'll say, you know what? It's just not worth it. It's better to just tell the truth. So moms and dads, confront dis dishonesty when you discover it in your children. Don't let a lie slip by. It's no big deal. The sooner we disrupt the pattern, the easier it'll be to break. The sooner our kids learn that every time they lie, they're going to have to admit it and ask forgiveness, the sooner they'll break the habit. Confession may not curb the whole problem, but it'll take us a long way in the right direction. 
the IRS received the following note from a man. Enclosed, you will find a check for $250. I cheated on my income tax return last year and have not been able to sleep since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I will send you the rest. <laughs> I mean, it seems laughable that a person would go just far enough to get their sleep to return, but not make a clean break. But if we make ourselves ask forgiveness every time, we'll find it so painful to do, it's a lot easier just to tell the truth. And fourth, enjoy the rewards of telling the truth. Although most of the commandments are stated in the negative, each one has a grand positive. You don't fulfill this commandment by, of, just by avoiding lying, but by telling the truth. Jesus says, all you need to say is yes or no. Let whatever you say be so truthful that people can believe you. When people learn that you tell the truth and they can trust you, you'll be rewarded many times over. To telling the truth brings its own reward. You feel in line with God. You feel good about yourself. And people trust you. You have good relationships. I've told nearly all of our nine kids at some time or another, if you learn to tell the truth, it'll pay off big time. Suppose one of my kids was hiking in uh, Eagle Creek Trail the day the, the fire started this fall. And uh, everybody's standing around at the base and, and the police are you know, interrogating people and somebody says, I saw him pointing to one of my kids. He was up there, I think he started the fire. So I take you aside and I say, I'm only going to ask you this once. Did you start that fire? You say, no, Dad. But I know who did. So I come back to the police and I say, you've got the wrong guy. He didn't do it. But he knows who did. There's a huge reward if your mother or father can trust you to always tell them the truth. When you say something, you won't need to swear on a stack of Bibles or cross your heart, hope to die, because people will know you tell the truth. Parents, it's so important that you tell the truth. If your kids hear you telling a lie over the phone or to somebody at the door, they picked up on that, that that's the way to live. Teenagers, the time to learn to tell the truth is while you're young. Young singles, telling the truth may seem like you're going cross grain with the rest of culture, but that is the way to live. Young marriage, it's so important that you learn to tell the truth to your mate. You can always trust each other. Empty nesters, you want to stay strong in your prime of life. Tell the truth. All of you, if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in, and the Holy Spirit will convict you every time you tell a lie. Christ followers should say what they mean and mean what they say. You say, I don't know if I can do this. Well, you know what? You're right. You can't. You're poor in spirit. You have to ask Jesus to help you tell the truth minute by minute through the day. Lord Jesus, thank you for your teaching here. And we confess that we are prone to lie, to say things that aren't true or exaggerate. Forgive us. Help us to tell the truth. Help us to depend on you to help us tell the truth. I want to give you a minute to talk to God right now. You just, why don't you confess to him if you've told a lie recently or you know you tend to do this, ask him to forgive you and to help you uh, tell the truth. Everybody pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, speaking to us through your word that is always true. 
uh, help us to tell the truth. Maybe there's a lot of lying going on in our world, but if it starts with us, maybe it can build. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.